from my point of view, emotions are the crucial part of our lives, not the facts. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I got the list of uh, your thoughts about what I could talk and uh, thank you very much for that as well. I used uh, part of them here, not everything. There were so many ideas, so I couldn't, I couldn't use them all. But um, well, let's talk about emotional well-being and wellness. You long, you possibly seen all my, my, my bio and so on, so we can skip that. I brought a small ag agenda for us. Um, First of all, there are some polls. I would like to know something about you. I will talk about what drives our lives. I brought you a hands-on experience, and then I hope we still have some time for some Q&A, okay? First poll, what drives our lives? Very curious to know what drives your life. Besides that Zoom call right now. Perfect. So these are already great. I, I think, thank you very much for sharing. And this is beautiful. And there's another poll coming up. Second poll. Who of you, and perhaps you can do that hand thingy with Zoom there. Um, who of you has felt happy in the last seven days? Perfect. Thank you very much. Now we'll go to the next one. Who has felt bad in the last seven days? Okay. And last one. Who has tried to feel happy again in the last seven days? Wonderful. Thank you very much for taking part in that poll. Um, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about a choice um, I might have to do one day or you might have to do one day. Um, just imagine you have $10,000 and you have to buy a car because you have to go to work or meet your family or go grocery shopping or something like this. And since there's some problems in the market, there are just these two options available. They both have the same color, so that's, that's, not, that's not an issue, um, but they're different. This left, this Citroen, this uh, French car has a very good mileage, 35 miles per gallon. It's very cheap in insurance and tax and possibly also in repairs because that's not much of a car there. That is one thing you notice because the seats are pretty inconvenient and, um, and it's very slow in acceleration, okay? So people are behind you and waiting till you're going to get on the highway, getting off the highway. So, but it's, it's pretty cheap. Low budget as the English would say. And then there's this other car, not so great mileage, way more expensive in insurance because people like that car so it gets stolen very often and the government likes that car as well so it taxes it heavily but it has comfortable seats and it feels a little bit like being in the movie you know that still remember that disney movie the love bug or herbie goes to monte carlo yeah so all these nice movies so it feels like being in that in that movie when you drive that car so now the question for me is which car to buy I have a very economic choice. That's the left one. Especially with our gas prices today, it would be very, very economic. It would be the cle uh, clever, factual choice to take. And then there is this choice from the heart, being in the movies, feeling good, having comfortable seats, talking to people about these nice movies, but paying more. So now imagine you're going with that car every day to work and you have a parking lot at your office or at your workplace. And everybody sees you driving with that almost a car thing on the left and then this right nice, nice car to work. How would you feel if you go with that Citroen? How would you feel every day getting in in the morning, sitting there, knowing that you took the clever choice the most economic choice, it will get you to the car, it will get you to work. It's not a safe car, it's very cheap. Or, well, for $10,000 you don't get a safe car, but you have that other car which, which makes you feel good, which uh, makes you a little bit feel proud, which helps you connect to other people because you can talk about the movies and you might even change the design and put that 52 on, on, on the front. 
So what choice should I make? For me, personally, it's very easy. I would take the right one. Though it's not economically very sens sensible, I would take that where it makes me feel good. Who's opposed? Who would take the other one? Who would take the very cheap one and be, ah, every morning? I don't see so many hands. And that is what we want to talk today. We want to talk today about emotions. Emotions drive our life. Okay? If we don't feel good, even if we get to work, we don't necessarily feel well and we're not that productive. If we don't have that calm sensation, we're not thinking clearly. Yeah, we are, you, you all know that, that there's that, this moment where you say something and then a week later you say, how could I have said something like this? And that is because we said something very emotional, out of emotion. So I use that story to explain and make it very clear that Though we live in a society where facts are king and where we want to explain and want to have an argument for everything in our life and want to, want to be very, very uh, 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 with a good mindset, that actually not the facts make our decisions, but our emotions do. We would never take a decision if it's completely against what we feel. And this is something now a little bit to reflect for you all, to go inside and think about your decisions and think about decisions which you did against your emotions and how they turned out and think about decisions which you did incompatible with your emotions. So from my point of view, emotions are the crucial part in our lives, not the facts. The facts come secondary. And so that also might, means that emotions determine what we think and what our mindset is. And this is what we're going to talk to be about today. And now we talk about emotions, but what really are emotions? I sometimes work with people and they come and I ask what emotion, oh, it's bad. Okay. What's, what's another emotion? Good. I said, okay. And else? No, there's just good and bad. I said, okay. Well, how about getting a little bit deeper? And usually if we go into the good emotions, people like to go there. People like to talk about hopefulness. They talked about optimism about belief, we even had that here in the list, about happiness, everybody wants to talk about happiness and passion, or even joy and freedom and love. But if we go to this emotions, which are usually classified as bad emotions, it's just frustration, impatience, overwhelm, disappointment, doubt, worry, blame, Oof, that already gets heavy, right? If we just think about these emotions. And then if we go into anger, hatred, jealousy, insecurity, or fear, or powerlessness, or helplessness, despair, oh boy, that's something we try not to think about so much. So on the one hand, we have emotions as a category, good and bad, and then we have a quality of emotions. And these were just the ones, the happy ones, and the not so happy ones. But then we have another thing. We have the quantity of emotions. You can be a little happy, or you can be very happy. You can be a little upset, medium upset, and very upset. So what I usually do with my clients is that we rate our emotions that we have between zero, nothing, that's not an emotion, it's not there, and 10 like the worst ever or the strongest ever, if we talk about happiness or something like this. And so for emotions, so far we learned that if I feel bad, my mood gets bad, I might not be so productive at work if I buy that left car, if I buy that Citroen car, or that I have perhaps love, happiness emotions, some happy emotions, that's quality, and then now we know that there is a quantity as well connected to this emotion. So what do we do with our emotions? Okay, so thank you very much. These are very, very helpful things. And I would like to talk about one thing, especially having a bad day. You come home, your partner comes home stressed as well. Your kids, or if you don't have kids anymore, your neighbors are loud. Okay. And somehow it's a bad day. 
what do we do? Ben and Jerry ice cream. There's also a vegan option there, but still it's sugar. <laughs> um, so that is something we numb them with food. Awesome. Exactly. That's one thing, how to handle emotions. Okay. So as you can see in that example, or you already have that experience as well, because you said it in the chat. Thank you for that. Having certain emotions can make it very complicated to stay on a diet. Okay. So the question is why? Why do we have these emotions? When on the one hand, we want to stay on a diet and then boom, our wish goes away. And to answer that question why, I would like to take you a little bit further away, just for a moment, just for two slides or so, and then perhaps we understand a little bit better on why we have these emotions and what, what is behind that all. So what do people strive for? If I ask people, many people say money, okay? There's lots behind it, but money or fame. Yeah? Think about all these titles in corporate America where you have like, Deputy, assistant, senior, chief, executive, fame. Relationship. You also mentioned that. Connection. Connection with other people. We humans are social animals, so animals. So we strive for relationship. Status, a little bit similar to, uh, to fame. Safety and security. Okay. If we don't feel safe, we we do something so we feel safe. And overall, I think underneath this all is health and well-being, what we strive for. So when we know that consciously, sometimes not so much, because sometimes we take conscious choices which are perhaps not ideal, okay? But we say, okay, I, I work for this company for one year because it pays well, but I actually want to do something else. This might be a conscious choice. But underneath, we know that there's a feeling of an emotion of, mm, I don't know I don't, if I w should work for them. But anyway, I'll do it. I react or overact or overcompensate on your emotions. But underneath, and, and for especially subconsciously, we're looking for health, we're looking for well-being. So when we look at our behavior, if that is something in, in, innate inside of us, which, which we cannot change, then our behavior is always directed towards what we strive for. As I said, sometimes we can make a conscious choice to, like I take you now on a small journey, or you can say, okay, I'll do that one or two years with that company to earn some money so I can pay off the house or pay off that car or whatever. But usually we strive for the well-being. But there are emotions that bug us. Yeah? The loud neighbor, the, the partner who is stressed. And then we change our behavior consciously and subconsciously and that is the thing the subconscious part we we say that there's just five to ten percent of us right now being conscious and then 90 to 95 percent of us are subconscious which is great because when you walk and then you take out your phone it's awesome that you have a subconscious part of you because then you can answer that phone call or you can answer that text or whatsapp or whatever while you walk and you don't have to stop and and do that you should look up, but usually I don't know if you meant uh, if you've seen that that even if we walk and there comes up a pole, you, you're coming closer to a pole, you somehow recognize it subconsciously and you just go a little bit to the left or to the right to avoid that pole. So the subconscious part on the one hand is great to have as a tool, uh, or when you walk and then you stumble and then you just catch yourself again and you don't fall. Awesome. Awesome that we have these reflexes, that we have a subconscious part which is helping us. But on the other hand, if it's, um, if it's driving our, our behavior, um, subconsciously we can change our behavior or perhaps even consciously, oh, this one ice cream won't hurt. Okay, you, ever, you always have heard that perhaps saying yourself or other people have said that to you. We change our behavior to avoid these bugging emotions. Okay, because that is what we learned. We all had our hands as small, small children and we, we touched something hot and we pulled it away and then we learned, okay, that's hot. And if we take the hand away, it's not hot anymore. Okay, so we learned that there's like a, um, something we can do. We can avoid, we can avoid pain by changing our behavior by moving the hand away. Even if we know it's not helpful. Okay, so... There are three modes. If we take everything that 
you said here ex except there are some things which are already really really towards what's coming onto the right end on that slide right now we can say if we have an emotional reaction we can either surrender to it frustrate i'm a victim nothing helps life is bad i would just completely surrender to it or avoid it by eating by doing sports by drinking alcohol, by taking drugs, by taking medication, by shouting, blaming other people for making them feel bad, so I feel better, okay? Trying to avoid that, um, that situation, try to avoid that emotion. What else did you have? Find a distraction that was something numb with food. Um, shame myself for the action. That's also like suppression of, of, that, of that emotion. Or we can overcompensate the... Uh, the most talked about overcompensation on the internet these days is the narcissist, okay? The person who is making other people feel worthless or even uh, uh, gaslighting them or something like this. That person actually is overcompensating for his or her inner feeling of being not very worthy, okay? So it's actually the behavior switches not to surrender and say, okay, I'm the victim, not to avoid looking left and right, but to overcompensate for what I'm feeling inside, I'm doing exactly the opposite of what I'm feeling inside and taking into account that other people get hurt. So these are coping modes. With coping modes, they're great. Eh? If I'm driving, I don't know, um, 75 miles per hour and something is in the radio and I cry, I'm happy to be able to just push it on the side, to slow down, go to a rest, to, to, to parking or somewhere. And then think about what has just triggered me. So coping modes are valid. Coping modes are really important. But coping modes are just coping modes. Okay, We are just coping with that situation. We're not resolving it. And the other thing, and that is resolving. And you guys had already really great ideas. Take a deep breath. Okay, That's something happening in the physiology of our body where change happens. Change happens to that stuck emotion that's there, that's wants to be processed and somebody said that you recognize and acknowledge recognizing and acknowledge is a strategy for recognizing that emotion acknowledging it and then not suppressing it and making it a stuck emotion but acknowledging it and letting it flow through the system so it can process the body can process that interestingly we humans have much problems with emotions if you look into the animal kingdom usually just the animals around humans have problems with their emotions, but other animals, the wild animals, they usually don't. If you, if you look like uh, antelopes, I think they're called, if a lion chases them, they're running for their lives. And they know if they're not quick enough, then the lion will kill them. Okay. And they're running, and for whatever reason, the lion is distracted. Perhaps there's there's somebody with a, with a gun or something, or something happens. So the lion is distracted and lets go of chasing that antelope. And um, the antelope will continue run, to run until there's a safe distance. Then it will stand and the whole body will start to shake for one minute, for two minutes. And the shaking actually gets rid, rid of these hormones of stress hormones of adrenaline and cortisol, which were created from the body to be able to flee that situation. And so the, the antelope will shiver and shake, shake, shake very strongly. And after that, it will start just to graze and be very calm. Now think about yourself when the last time you had an argument with your partner, with your neighbor or something, and you were like very agitated and you felt your heart rate go quick and you have felt that heat in your, in your face. And then you went out of the situation somehow. Did you go back home and shake? No. Well, you still had these cortisols and, cort uh, uh, and adrenaline in your system. So something must have happened. Your body needs a uh, balance. And if you didn't shake and if you didn't make that body r r use all of that, uh, these hormones, they're still in your system. And they are causing a stuck emotion. Yeah? As, as a child, for example, another mechanism to, um, to get rid of these emotions is crying. And as a child, I've been told boys don't cry. And there's even, isn't there even a song, yeah, Men Don't Cry or something like this? So that is a way to release emotions, crying, and the society says, nope, you shouldn't use that one. So there's shaking and 
cry. Um, connecting to the sensation, awesome. Um, uh, in front of my body. That is an interesting thing. That's something that's already very advanced, connecting to the sensation in front of the body, because then I'm basically taking that emotion in front of me. I'm a little bit out of body and looking at it. Now, as long as I look at it and process it, that's perfect. And I can have a dialogue with it. That's awesome. That's actually one thing we use in the inner unity modality to, to get rid of the emotion, to just dialogue and just see both, both angles. That's, that's already very advanced. Um, honor them, same thing. If I honor them, I can let them, I can feel them, I can let them flow through my system, and I can let them be processed and feel them. Amazing. Shame for the action, that is a little bit of a problematic one because that's the opposite. Okay. I shame myself for having that emotional reaction. So I'm basically suppressing it. I'm not feeling it. I'm not letting it be so pro uh, uh, processed in my body. So it gets stuck in my body. It's still there. And why is a stuck emotion a problem? Because it comes up. It comes up eventually when something triggers it. When it get, gets triggered by a stressed partner, a loud neighbor, even the, uh, the, 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 uh, a flower, just seeing a flower, just smelling a flower, just tasting a certain coffee when you had certain flavor of coffee when you had that emotional reaction can remind your body Oh, that is like that time. And then it gets back into that situ situation. You feel that emotion again and your mind doesn't understand it usually because your mind just says, I'm sitting here at, I don't know, Panera Bread and having that flavored coffee and I'm feeling sad. Why? <laughs> the mind can't make sense out of it. But because your body remembers, your subconscious remembers that 15 years ago, your partner broke up with you at Panera and then boom, okay? Or even not at Panera, but having a coffee from Panera. So it's not even the surroundings, but just the taste of the coffee. So that's why coping modes are great if you're in a situation where you need to cope. But when you're out of that situation, yeah, that antelope had to run for their life, okay? It had to overcompensate. It had to run stronger than, than ever because it wanted to get rid of that, uh, got, wanted to get away from that lion. But now the line is gone and now I need to do something with that emotion. I need to resolve that stuck emotion. I need to resolve and reset my system. And if you like, we can do that right now here. So I brought to you two exercises, which I would love to do with you. Um, I would love to show you that exercise, but you do it at your own risk. Okay. So that's the disclaimer here. So if, if you are not willing to take that risk, then please uh, don't do that exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the hand on X exercise, the first one is the candle exercise. It's an exercise to feel inside your body, to learn to feel more inside your body than you perhaps have done before. And if that exercise went well, we'll go to the other exercise. Now imagine. On your hands, if you put your hands like this, I, I put them up. You don't have to put them up, okay? You just put your hands face palm, palm facing up and you have a, have a small candle, okay? You have a small candle on your hands, not a big one, okay? No, you should try a nice small one, like a small one, like a small candle on your hands, okay? And you have your hands like this, you can you have that small candle and then you imagine a small flame on that candle, okay? And just on one candle, there's just one flame on one candle. We'll start with the left side, perhaps. And if you have that flame on that candle, just feel how your hand feels. Perhaps you don't feel anything at, at, in, the, in the moment. Okay, that's fine. And just put your other hand behind, besides it. And there you just have a candle, but no flame. And try to see if you feel a difference. Okay, when with that hand where you imagine the flame and uh, the hand where you don't imagine the flame. Can you all feel a difference there? Who, who? And now imagine that this candle, that this flame just jumps to the other hand. And now this hand here has a candle with a flame. And now feel how your hand feels differently. What changed in your hand? Do you notice a change? Good. Okay. Maddie also? You notice a change? If you, and now you can play a little bit with it and just let the flame jump from candle here to candle there and just jump, let it just in your imagination, let it jump and just notice how your hand feels different every time 
the flame comes to that hand or to the other one. Okay? This is an exercise which we do for our body awareness or the center of awareness as we call it, which is a function we have that we can feel inside. We can feel inside, but we're not necessarily aware. For example, if I don't mention that and you are wearing a necklace, now you're aware of your necklace. You weren't aware of your necklace before, but now since I mentioned it, boom, it pops into your mind. And you see, you had that necklace around your neck all the time. But just because I mentioned it puts part of your attention, part of your awareness on that part where your necklace is or your sweater or your shirt or whatever. And then you say, oh, I notice it. Okay, so we can actually in our body ignore parts of our body and be present with other parts of our body. And this exercise, if you do that with a flame, jump, 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 you notice that there's a change. And you can make that exercise even bigger. Now, if you imagine not only having candles on your hands, but on your feet, okay? Small candles on your feet, on the back of your feet. And now you can have that flame jump from the left feet, foot to the right foot, from the right foot to the right hand, and from the right hand to the left hand, and from the left hand to the left foot. And each time the flame jumps, you notice that there's something different in your foot or in your hand. If you can do that easily, perfect. And if that costs you a little bit, very good. Then you can practice it more and more and more until it's an easy exercise for you. And you don't have to go this way. You can do the other way around. Yeah, you can do and cross, crisscross and whatever. That's Everything is fine. It's just about being able to notice where I feel myself in the body. And when I'm able to feel myself in the body, I'm, for example, not away. I'm not running away from my emotions. I'm present with myself. And if I'm very, very present with myself, actually, this is something that our forefathers were able to do. They were so present, so they were able to go bare feet across a meadow, and they would feel if there would be a bee or some other animal that might hurt you when you step, uh, 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 step on it, and they would feel it before they set down their foot. And they would just subconsciously put the foot on the other side and won't hurt that other creature. I feel that perfect and wonderful because we are here in a group of people who decided not to hurt other creatures as well. So this might be something you want to train, okay? And um, it needs training, okay? Usually in our Western society, we're just here, okay? Here in, this, in the head, a little bit in the chest. Some people are in the, in the heart as well. Usually these are the people who are more loving and kind to other people. But we have a whole body. There's more below the chest as well. Okay, there's, there's solar plexus. That's the area where we have our energy coming from. And then there's even more below. So if you like that small exercise, I would like to go with you to the next exercise. Point. And let's go to the next exercise. Now I would like you to think about an incident where you did a food choice that wasn't so helpful. And please watch my language here. I'm trying to avoid wrong. Okay, I put that below there in one of the things. I said there's no wrong answers because I know that our subconscious and our critic inside always says, oh, I'm not saying that that might be wrong. So that's why I use the word wrong. But usually I'm using the word not helpful. Okay, because we're never wrong. We're just having an experience and that experience might not be helpful or might not help us to reach our goal, but it's not wrong. Okay. So think about an incident where you made a food choice which was not helpful. If you now have that food, that, that incident, that moment, that situation in your, in your hand, please think about how you felt in that moment. What was the predominant emotion? Perhaps sometimes if you, if you think, okay, I, I don't know, I went, took a bit of Ben and Jerry's, not taking the Ben and Jerry's. That's not actually the moment. We have to go a little bit before. Just before the moment when you said, oh, Ben and Jerry's. I have Ben and Jerry's in my fridge. Just the moment before, you just go there and then you feel, what was it? Was it overwhelm? Was it anger? Was it frustration? What was the emotion that you had before you did that food choice, which wasn't so helpful? Okay. And when you... When you found that emotion, 
try to feel this emotion. Try to feel this emotion in your body. Try to feel it where it is in your body. Is it in your head? Is it in your throat? Is it in your chest? Is it in your solar plexus? Is it the uh, middle abdomen? Is it the lower abdomen? Is it in your back? Is it between the legs? Wherever it is, everything is fine. Just feel this emotion, how it feels, and feel if there's weight associated to it. Okay? Good. Perfect. And now we do something, a small meditation, which I would like to guide you through. Um, it's beautiful. If you can close your eyes, you can do it with open eyes. You don't have to do it. It's an offer. Okay? Whoever wants to is invited to do that meditation. So, I would recommend to close your eyes and just feel that emotion inside of you. Just be very, very, very aware of that emotion inside of you. And now you imagine that you, including that emotion, go up. Go up, 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 until you see yourself from the from your, from the from the top of your room, from the roof, and then you go up and you go up and you see your house from above, and you even further up, and you see your city from above. And then when you see your city from above, you go further up, you go further up, 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 and you see your county from above. You see your state from above. And the whole country. And you can even go further and then you see the whole world. Now you change your direction and you look towards the sun. This sun we're looking at right now is exactly looks exactly the way our sun looks. There's just a difference. This sun doesn't burn. And so you get closer and you get closer to that sun. And you see the sun getting bigger and bigger while you're getting closer and closer to that sun. And you're getting closer. Oh, the sun is now so big. It's incredibly large in front of you. And you connect to it. And it's easy to just slide into the sun. And you notice that there's a transportation system. And that transportation system carries you effortlessly towards the center of this beautiful sun. You don't have to do anything. You're just there passively being transported to the center of the sun. And you know that you're in the center of the sun when there's no movement. So you're being transported towards the center of the sun and now there's no movement. Now you are in the middle of this beautiful golden sun and there's warm, wonderful golden liquid surrounding you. And now you let this wonderful golden liquid of the sun enter your body and fill you up especially in the place where you felt that emotion. You go first to that place where you felt that emotion and now you let the sun, that wonderful golden liquid of the sun, fill up that spot where you have felt that emotion. And if there's trouble, if the emotion doesn't want to get filled, you just put your attention towards that spot where that emotion is and wait. And you just put your attention to that spot and wait until that beautiful golden liquid of the sun fills that spot up. Now, when that spot is filled, you let that beautiful golden liquid of the sun fill up your whole body. Every inch of your body is going to be filled with that wonderful golden liquid of the sun that surrounds you. 
from your head to your throat, to your chest, to your body, to the abdomen, to your legs, arms, hands and feet. Everything is going to be filled up with that beautiful golden liquid of the sun. And if there's a space which doesn't want to fill up, if there's a blank space, again, you just put your attention to that space and wait. You do nothing else than just putting that attention to that space and wait. You wait until that space gets filled up. And you scan your whole body. You scan your whole body. If there's still some space left which isn't filled up, and you put your attention on that, wait until that filled up. And you do that until you're completely filled up. Okay, now we continue and you expand a little bit. You make yourself bigger just a little bit. And please note what's happening inside of you when you expand a little bit. There might be places inside of you that don't want to expand. And here again, you just put your attention to these places where you have some tension and you wait. You wait until the tension releases and you just let it flow. Let the golden liquid of the sun flow in, let it fill up. And when there's no tension, you expand a little further. And then you look inside of you again. If there's, if there's spaces with tension, you put your attention on these spaces. Wait until they relax. And then you expand further. And you do that with all the time you need, with all the calmness being very thorough with that until you reach the size of the sun. And then again, when you have the size of the sun, just raise your hand so I know you're there. Mm -hmm. And you just expand a little further where everybody doesn't reach the sun and now everybody has reached the size of the sun and now you expand further bigger than the sun you radiate outside into the space you see yourself floating in space 360 degrees of star constellations around you you're floating calm through the space just enjoying and radiating outside that beautiful light of yours and enjoy this calm and peace. And now, whenever you like, you can come back to the here and now. Just before you open your eyes, move your feet, move your arms. When you open your eyes, just look around, get yourself acquainted again with the room where you're in, and then you're completely in the here now. So, how do you feel? So how do you feel? What happened to your emotion? Who of you feel your emotions? Still feel your emotion? Oh, no hands. Nice. Okay. So now you have an experience of what I do with my clients to get these stuck emotions resolved and feel better. And then the behavior changes, food choices get easier, and not only food choices, all choices in life and behavior gets easier and more helpful. So now it's time for q and I'm very curious of what you'd like to know and uh, where I can help you with. How do you help someone with depression and food addiction? Very good question. Perfect question. I love that question. Um, if we go back to that, what we discussed about the coping modes, 
we have basically these three things that we can do. We can surrender, we can avoid, and we can overcompensate. And everything you see yourself doing is either surrendering, avoidance, or overcompensation. Or, and I'm very proud of you telling that, that like connect to the uh, sensation in front of my body, honor that, don't be scared, recognize and acknowledge. These are already wonderful techniques to, to start processing emotions. And, um, but if we are in the coping modes, depression is a coping mode for avoidance. So depression basically is a switch. I turn off my emotions. I don't feel anything. And because I don't feel anything, I either feel avoid inside of me or I feel, um, feel nothing. Okay. And if I feel nothing, that feels I mean, life without emotions is actually no life. And that is depression. And so depression is just a way to avoid an inner struggle that I have very strong emotions. So people who are depressed usually don't have just like, oh, I get upset when my neighbor is loud. There's way more in their lives and they have tried everything. They have tried everything to, to, to figure it out and they, they can't. And then because there's so much uh, turmoil going on, the body says off and then it's off. Okay. And so with people with depression, um, it's very important to get active, Hi. giving in wonderful advice. Walks have been life-saving for Julie. Exactly. Yeah. One way to deal with depression is to get active again and start trusting in yourself, start trusting in your um, emotions. And that is a slow process, okay? Because depression didn't come like this. And whoever says depression, I, I felt well, and then depression came, yeah, usually not. There's been lots going on, and then depression was just the flip of the switch. In, in, in therapy for depression, we usually want to give very active, okay? In psychotherapy, we want to get very active. We want to help people to not be scared of their emotion. Don't be scared. Somebody of you said that as well. And then slowly, 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 people get trust themselves again, trust the emotions again. And there are a couple of exercises like the sun meditation. Yeah, if you, if you learn how to deal with emotions, you get more confident about, okay, okay, there's emotions and I know how to deal with them. So woo, I can, I can try to nah, just a inch and then, okay, I know how it works. <laughs> and then you, you continue. Usually that takes a while because as I said, depression didn't, 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 didn't come uh, overnight as well. And food addiction is also a way of avoiding. And that's what we did in the exercise. We, we were feeling the emotion before taking certain food, an emotion that had, has made, has made us change our behavior to go to that um, food. And um, and usually we use these, these these techniques are called emotionally activating interventions. So we're using these techniques or others to basically work with our emotion and then slowly, slowly. So you don't need the food addiction anymore to regulate your emotion. It's hard to live with the guilt of destructive food choices. It can spiral. Exactly. So this is a little bit of bigger issue. Um, bigger topic, not issue, bigger topic. As we said before, it's really important from my point of view, how, what, what words we're using. When we're using, for example, the word shame or mm -hmm. destructive food choices, we are actually shaming ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now if you imagine yourself, I mean, you have seen that all in Hollywood movies. If we look into the mirror, we are not one. Okay. We think we are one. We have one nose, two eyes, and we are one person as we define person. But in Hollywood movies, you sometimes see the angel, and the devil. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is just a cinematic expression of that there's more than one opinion in us for one topic. Okay. So we are not a robot who's programmed to just do one thing, but we are, we have several ideas. And that has to do with my mom brought me up, my dad brought me up. And usually they are not one, okay? They are two independent people. And these independent people have their own opinion. And dad says, it's important to go out in the rain. And mom says, no, you can catch a cold or the opposite, right? That's no gender thing. doesn't matter. So, um, and what, as a child, what do I learn? Huh? Both. Okay. So if dad is at home, I go out. If mom is at home, I don't go out. If both of them at home, I ask. Okay. That's what I learned. But still, I have these two voices in my head. And when I grow up now and it's raining, what do I do? Okay, I have to make up my mind. I have to make up my own experience and learn and build my personality. That's what our teenagers do. Why well, it's sometimes so difficult to deal with them. Okay, because they're trying to make sense of out of everything they learned when we when we um, when we brought them up. So um, we have a critic, 
We have a critic inside of us, or not one, who is helping us trying to avoid problems. So in different methodologies and, and, and therapies, the critic is always like we learn to have that critic distance and so on. That's important, okay? If your critic is, is, is criticizing you and you're right now in an interview trying to present you from the best from the rest uh, side, and then there's the critic telling you, ah, you can't do it and so on, you have to make that critic somehow shut up and get out, yeah, get, get further, because you have to concentrate on, on your interview right now. So um, one thing is to be able to see that there's a critic, accept that there's a critic and say, okay, shut up. The next thing is to understand that, that's the second step, that this critic is actually trying to help you, trying to avoid pain, trying to avoid um, problems because that critic has been formed while you were a child and, lear and, and learned when you do this, then your teacher is shaming you. If you do this, then your grandma is unhappy and so on. And so that critic is basically just a recording of the past events. And that critic will tell you that's a destructive food choice. Okay, but who made that choice? There was some other part, huh? the angel and devil. There's another part. I don't use angel and devil. I just work with parts so that they're uh, uh, parts of you. Another part of you wanted that food choice. So that part of you wanted that food choice and that part didn't want that food choice. And that's the critic. And that part perhaps wanted that food choice because he or she felt sad because the day didn't go so well. And then the critic comes and says, that was destructive. That is bad. You are bad. How does that part feel? Better or worse? And what does the critic actually do when that critic is shaming that part who already, which already, who, who she and he already feels bad? That part gets into full, I need more food mode. Okay. And then this critic goes again, and then there's a vicious cycle. Okay. And then we completely feel bad and boom, and everything, the whole, the whole evening is, is, is gone. So that's why I say, okay, the critic wants you wants to prevent damage from you, wants that you feel good, but does it in a way which is not helpful. Now we are all adults and we can decide how we talk to ourselves. And if we decide that we talk to ourselves in a very kind and accepting way, like, okay, I didn't do a helpful food choice. Okay, why didn't I do that? Now we go, why, what purpose did that, that food choice uh, deal with? Oh, I was avoiding that emotion of, Frustration because my boss yelled at me. Now you understand yourself much better, don't you? And now with that understanding and with that kindness, that part that made that food choice fails seen. And if some part of you feels seen, it's not going and trying to hide. It's just saying, oh, I can be. And slowly, slowly, and that's just the start, but that's slowly basically what we do in, in, in coaching or in therapy. We learn to be accepting of our choices and then learn to basically unite this critic and the other part. And then that is much nicer. Okay? Is there something in addition when these emotions come up, we can do as maintenance, like an everyday exercise, instead of waiting for something to happen? Be beautiful, beautiful thing. So activity. Sports, yoga, walking, nordic walking, jogging, um, perfect, okay? This helps people who do sports don't suffer so high up and downs with the emotion. They're like more like this, okay? Then obviously emotional stuff like meditation, like the sun meditation, for example. But the most important stuff uh, thing is to start working on yourself, be more conscious about yourself, reflect on yourself. And this sometimes can be really scary, I understand. And that's why you shouldn't do it alone. <laughs> and that's why there are people who have been trained to work with you and to go back to choices and talk about them. But for me, talking is just part of it. It's really important, as, we, as we've seen in the talk, that we are being um, aware of our emotions. And just the newer therapies, like ACT, schema therapy or inner unity or peak states or whatever I, I do, just these therapies that actually work with emotions um, can change something, okay? You have to work with your emotions. You have to process what has happened to you, okay? And that can be small things, like you have drawn a picture as a child and you went to your mom and wanted to show that picture and just wanted to have some recognition. And your mom said, go away, I have to cook. She didn't mean that in a bad way. She was just busy and overwhelmed. 
But you as a child said, oh, my mom doesn't like me anymore. And that's fair. That was your impression. Your impression isn't wrong. It's just your impression. And you have hold on to that, to that impression for a long time. And that hurts. And that's sometimes even stinky inside. And so you have to work with all these old things slowly, not everything at all at once, because then you are getting in that overwhelmed situation. And that usually you don't do alone. You can do it with a friend in a self-help setup. If you're in a stable, if you have, if you're emotionally stable, or you go to somebody who, who has learned to guide people through these experiences, and then um, it's a little bit easier. I hope that helps. How can we invite another person who is not necessarily skilled as you are to be present with us in our difficult emotions in a way that would be supportive? Wow, that's a difficult question. Thank you very much. Um, and um, there are certain groups of people that gather Okay, you find them on the internet and they do self-help. So they follow this this modality and that modality and then you meet and then you cry and then you hug and then you you process your emotions. I like that. But there's always a possibility that something goes a little bit wrong. And so it would be awesome to have somebody who, who can help you. And as I said, therapists who do ACT, A-C-T, beautiful. They work with emotion. Therapists that do schema therapy, beautiful. Therapists that do inner unity, that do peak states work, that do trauma work, um, awesome. Therapists that just talk about it, it's it's a way to understand, to get you know yourself better. For example, the this this Freud therapy, and you they write so much so big books about you, and that's five th five years of therapy. And I'm not a big fan of that. Okay, I like to work with what we have right now, a very pragmatic approach. Right now, I'm feeling. Good, perfect. But when I'm going to pass the bakery, I'm feeling bad. Okay, why do I feel bad? Is that something worth I want to explore? And then I do that. Okay, and then I use my therapist for doing that. So I hope that helps a little bit. It's it's a big topic. It's a huge topic, emotions. But I'm very happy that you're so open to it. And I think that's basically already now the time. Yeah, we we in 2022, we are all being more open to our emotion, being more open what drives us, and we're not closing down like perhaps our grandparents or parents who said, no, I have to power through. Nah, you don't have to power through. Just be with yourself and be kind to yourself. I think that's if that's the only thing you take from today, just to be kind to yourself, I think that would will make a huge difference in your life.